Good day, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Go Clean Energy Conference. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our generous volunteers, speakers, moderators, and sponsors. Our sponsors include Pure Light Power, Ledge Capital, Pacific Power, Deschutes County Solid Waste, Energy Trust of Oregon, G5, Neil Kelly, National Car Charging, MindClick, First Interstate Bank, and Republic Services. I'd also like to give a special thank you to Amy Perez, our web designer, and Set in Motion Marketing. Please honor these businesses with your business and your patronage as they have made this conference possible. It is only through the generous support of our volunteers and sponsors that we can bring all of this great information to you. Also, I'd like to remind everyone that there are four remaining panels, actually three remaining panels for our conference. So please, if you haven't already, register for the CPACE panel and breakout sessions, as well as Solar for Everyone. And you'll see a link in the chat box shortly on where you can register for those panels. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Jordan Palmieri, who will begin this session on managing construction waste. Thank you, Jordan. Oh. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? Great. Uh, welcome. My name is Jordan Palmieri. I work with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, I work in the materials management program there. And uh, today I'm going to be uh, your moderator and uh, the first speaker. So uh, we're going to be talking all about construction waste and new um, construction techniques as well um, here in Deschutes County. And we have four speakers today, um, and we're going to go for about 45 minutes or so, and then um, go into a panel discussion afterwards. So please do use the Q&A function to type your questions into the panel. Um, at any point, if you have a question, just type it in, and we will address them as a panel at the end. So thank you. And uh, I'm going to launch in here. So uh, we're going to start by talking about um, building material flows uh, into Deschutes County. And we'll start, we'll first sort of take a step back and uh, look at the carbon impacts of building material flows in the whole state, and then dive a little deeper into the actual waste stream in Deschutes County, and followed by a uh, little bit of what DEQ is doing um, in this arena. So let's start with the big picture. Here are all of Oregon's most recent consumption-based greenhouse gas emissions. And we can see that the production and consumption of building materials comprises about 8% of all emissions. Um, and building operations comprises about 22%. Now this is pretty consistent with other greenhouse gas inventories at the national and interna international levels. And uh, now let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into the building material impacts themselves. I'm gonna take that little slice of this pie, pie chart here and throw it in a bar chart. So here's that chart. These building material impacts represent the status quo of consuming and recovering and or disposing of building materials in Oregon. Now in the next chart, I'm gonna show you what the impact would be if we consume building materials without any sort of recovery system in the state. So here's that impact. Here we can see the impacts are considerably higher without a material recovery system in Oregon. This means that we are already doing a pretty good job at recovering materials and reducing carbon emissions in the construction sector statewide. I mean, these really are pretty significant reductions. Now, since I work in a program that regulates solid waste and recycling across the state, we wanted to know how much more we could reduce emissions from building materials through optimizing recovery quantities and pathways. So here's what we found. We found that sending the maximum amount of construction and demolition waste to their optimal end-of-life pathways showed a fairly small additional benefit. 
The scenario on the right shows that an optimal end of life destination um, scenario would only decrease impacts by about an additional 12%. So there's, there's a few lessons here. Number one, our recovery system is already reaping really large benefits. Number two, more reductions are possible, but they are relatively small and, and may take a lot of effort if additional recovery infrastructure is needed for new materials. And number three, and this is the most important, is that we can't recycle our way out of climate change. Even if we recover everything, we're still left with these really large impacts shown in the bar on the right. Now we still see these large impacts in the optimal recovery scenario because those impacts represent the consumption of building materials that make their way into new and existing building stock through construction and remodeling. Materials are definitely being consumed faster than they are showing up in the waste stream because Oregon is growing. People are moving here and we're adding new building stock. I know folks in Deschutes County have certainly seen constant growth over the last few years. Those materials consumed is what is making it into that big bar on the right there. So this is why it's so important to focus beyond the waste stream and focus um, design and construction teams on consuming fewer materials, reusing materials, and then finally specifying lower impact materials. I think we're gonna talk about a little of all of those today. If we're to meet our state's climate goals, we need to cut this bar in half in the next 10 to 15 years. And we can't just do that through more recovery. All right, so let's take a little bit of a deeper dive at the waste stream itself in Deschutes County. Today, I'm gonna to share some waste stream data from a publicly available tool that Oregon DEQ just finished developing. We literally released this tool last week. Uh, there's a ton of data and I'm still digesting it myself. Um, the address uh, for, it's an app, it's a web-based app, is down below. It's ridiculously long and complicated. I promise that I will post it in the chat um, after I get out of presentation mode here. And um, this tool covers the whole waste stream, uh, but today we're just going to focus on the building material sector. And it basically takes weights of materials disposed and or recovered in the waste stream and calculates the life cycle environmental impacts using about 10 different uh, life cycle assessment impact categories. And carbon emissions are just one of those. All right, our data sources for some of the, the information I'm gonna share um, is number one, Oregon DEQ's material recovery sur survey. This is an annual survey where every material recycler handling materials is required to report to DEQ on the types, quantity, and final destinations for their materials. On the disposal side, uh, we use our waste composition study, which happens every, every few years, and takes over a thousand different samples of landfill bound waste and characterizes it into different material categories. When you combine this data, you basically get a really good, big, good picture of what's being recovered and what's being disposed. And then we just apply LCA impact factors to each material. It sounds simple, but it was actually quite an involved project. The background data used for the impact factors was third party reviewed and uh, we used it the Gabby database, uh, which happens to be the same background data as the tally tool uses. I mentioned the tally tool because increasingly we're seeing architecture, design and engineering teams using tally, which is uh, a, a Revit plugin tool to model the impacts of their materials that they're specifying. Um, now we made the impact factors and our code publicly available on GitHub for anyone to take, use and improve. Uh, as a public agency, transparency, transparency is really important to us. So we really want other people to take this model and make it better. And speaking of transparency, before I jump into the data, I did wanna disclose a couple of key building materials that are not included in this analysis. Those materials are concrete and asphalt. Uh, the reason they're missing from the charts is because we don't track these materials in the waste stream. They aren't considered solid waste. They're considered clean fill and not something we track by law. Now, just because they're missing from some of this data does not mean they're not important. We know each of these materials has a really high carbon footprint and we have active projects in both these sectors to reduce impacts, which I'll cover a little bit of later. All right, jumping into some of the results here. Here are the global warming potential impacts of construction and demolition materials in Deschutes County. The data here shows us the current net impacts of producing, consuming, and the end of life fates of each material in Deschutes County. 
we can see that wood, cardboard, and metal are the most impactful materials. So it's good that Deschutes County already has recovery programs in place for these three materials. We're gonna hear more from Chad today about the status of these programs. Now we can see that plastics and carpeting also have large impacts, but they don't really have active recovery systems in place right now. What this chart doesn't show us yet is the additional recovery potential we have by directing these materials to their best, better uses at the end of life. In the next chart, you're gonna see the same materials paired with additional reductions possible if all of these materials in the waste stream go to the most beneficial end of life pathway. So here we go. Same materials. And now I wanna focus your attention to the difference between the bars, right? So the difference between the bars for each materials represents the magnitude of additional carbon reduction opportunities for each material. The bigger the difference, the more potential there is. So we can see that scrap metal and cardboard and rigid plastics represent largest opportunities for additional recovery. For metals and cardboard, again, this is good news since we already have the infrastructure to support this. We simply need more source separation and recovery. Our plastics, plastics infrastructure is, is less developed but still has large potential. When we look at asphalt roofing and carpeting, there's certainly recovery potential, but there may be significant infrastructure challenges to get more of these materials recovered. Now we're gonna shift for a moment to a single material to look at the impacts of different end of life pathways. For this next example, we're gonna focus on glass. Now, most of our glass recovered in Oregon is container glass, not you know, plate glass or window glass. But you'll notice here that some of the end of life opportunities in this next chart for recycled glass are to recycle glass into a variety of different building materials, which is why I chose to focus on it as an example. I'm also focusing on glass because for much of Eastern and Southern Oregon, glass is a very difficult material to recycle. The markets are dwindling and it's becoming increasingly expensive to transport it to end markets. So, all right, here is the glass chart. Here's the global warming potential impacts of producing glass and recovering it in various ways. The big bar on top is the impact of producing one ton of glass. Any bar that extends all the way to the left represents the benefits of recovering glass. Again, benefits per ton of glass. You'll notice that recycling glass into a glass container, which is the third to the bottom, I'm not too sure if you could see my pointer there, um, are relatively small. And uh, a lot of this surprises a lot of people. And one of the reasons are is, is that when we recycle glass back into containers, we still have to melt that glass in a huge furnace. Um, and that's where the majority of the impacts in making glass bottles are. So um, we're not offsetting all that much um, when it goes to container. We get a few more benefits when we're looking uh, recycling to fiberglass insulation, which is great. And then reusing of the containers, right? The old fashioned wash the bottle out and reuse it again, huge benefits because we're avoiding that big furnace. Finally, the last one is recycling it into glass pozzolan. Now, glass pozzolan is a cement substitute used in concrete mixes. It has great potential. Essentially, you're grinding glass into a very fine powder and it acts like a cement binder, kind of like a, a fly ash does. It's, it's, a, it's a natural pozzolan. This is kind of one of the main reasons we put this tool together was to help direct materials to the most beneficial end of life pathway. Well, since glass pozzolan shows here as the most beneficial pathway, we started over a year ago working to connect glass pozzolan manufacturers with concrete producers and glass suppliers. At this point, we've only had some bench scale testing done um, it, for concrete producers in the Willamette Valley, but we're hoping to get an actual pilot project on the ground soon. I'm gonna move on here, but, but the point is that, that not all recycling is created equal, right? Uh, like where these materials go at the end of the day is important. All right, so some ideas for the Deschutes County building community. So to wrap this section up, I, I think people overall in the architecture, engineering, design, construction community should be spending their time reducing material impacts in alignment with the life cycle impacts of these materials. So since we learned the vast majority of building material impacts are due to production, we should be focusing the majority of our time reducing the impacts of production by building less, building smaller, reusing both materials and buildings, and then finally specifying lower impact materials. 
we're going to hear about some of those possible materials in a presentation later today from Karen. For recovery, we probably should be improving the efficiencies within the existing recovery infrastructure and not spending a whole lot of time and energy recovering every last scrap of waste from construction sites. Now, I say this because from a public investment standpoint, additional recovery in the C&D sector may take a large investment in additional infrastructure and it, that may be difficult. Instead, in Oregon, we're moving more towards a model of producer responsibility where the materials manufacturers themselves take responsibility for the recovery of their materials at the end of life. Now we already see this program in Oregon for electronics, paint, prescription drugs, and now packaging based off of a recent bill passed in 2021. I'd like to see more of this for building materials in the future. All right, I'm gonna wrap up with a few slides about what Oregon DEQ is doing in this space. First, starting with our regulatory authority over landfills. We just did a rulemaking last week um, to basically make the emission standards for methane and landfills more stringent. So landfills around the state will be needing to inspect landfills more and install more gas recovery systems because of this. Um, switching gears for, to non-regulatory, we do a lot of work around deconstruction. We do a lot of work supporting policy and research. We recently worked with the city of Portland to analyze the first environment, the first, the environmental benefits of the first 40 homes that were deconstructed through their first in the nation policy that passed a few years back. We found that deconstruction doubles the carbon savings compared to mechanical demolition, which then helped support an expansion of this residential policy recently. We've also given plenty of grants to deconstruction. Uh, the grants are typically used for equipment purchases, truck purchases, and workforce training. Another grant we recently awarded was a grant to provide free tally software training. I mentioned the software earlier. It basically models the impacts of building materials. COVID delayed these workshops significantly, but we hope to offer them now in the spring of 2022, with um, one of the workshops being targeted for Central Oregon. We do a lot of work around concrete and have spent years working with concrete producers, getting them to produce environmental product declarations. Um, these basically disclose the carbon footprint of different mixes. And um, now we're working with the city of Portland to actually use these EPDs to help them source lower impact concrete. We're helping the city of Portland develop carbon limits for a first in the country concrete EPD policy that actually requires EPDs um, for city purchases and then sets limits on the carbon as well. Uh, we also started work with the city of Bend recently on their concrete procurement practices and hope we can replicate some of the successes we've seen in Portland. Um, we have lots of smart and capable concrete producers in Deschutes County that are fully capable of delivering low carbon mixes to your job sites. So just ask. We've been conducting whole building LCA for project teams um, to help consult on material reduction strategies for state buildings. Um, this is a case study we recently published of a net zero energy resilient building un under construction in Salem. Uh, this will house the Oregon State Treasury. And finally, we're working on a pilot project um, and designing an incentive program for sustainable and equitable build buildings. This is modeled off of a, a program that's happening in Seattle at the moment. Last but not least, we um, are producing a strategic plan by the end of this calendar year and hope with that plan, we can reach out to communities and new partners all around Oregon, including folks in Deschutes County um, with more good projects um, in the coming calendar year. So thank you so much for your time. I'm gonna uh, stop sharing here and uh, turn it over to Chad. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can I be, can you hear me? Can you see everything? Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, what's going on with construction demolition waste uh, management in Deschutes County. Um, I'm, I'm the, uh, the the interim director for the Salt Waste Department. I've been working with Not Landfill for um, about uh, 23 years, and uh, been seeing a lot of things happen over the years. Um, I'm going to talk first about what uh, what the services we have to offer to the construction and building industry and what is happening in the future with uh, solid waste management in Deschutes County. Um, great. There we go. Okay. So <clears throat> not landfill. That's uh, the, the primary facility in Deschutes County. All waste generated in the county primarily ends up here. 
uh, started operating in uh, 1972 as a uh, as back in the day they were called dumps. We, they were not very well regulated, uh, kind of a loosely run operations. Uh, the uh, rules started changing in the 1990s, and not landfill transitioned into a, a modern engineered landfill. We have uh, liner systems, gas collection systems, operate under uh, fairly tight criteria and standards. Um, our facility is designed to accept municipal industrial solid waste, as well as construction and demolition material. And we also have a, a full service recycling center available here on our campus as well. Uh, we operate uh, three transfer stations in the Chutes County. Um, uh, there are, our largest of the transfer stations is up in Redmond, uh, the neatest transfer station out east of town. We have a, another transfer station a couple miles north of Lapine, right off of Highway 97, the Southwest Transfer Station. And then our, our third facility is on Friar Road, uh, east of Sisters. Uh, <clears throat> these facilities were actually developed on old dump sites that we had to close when the regulations changed. We had to transition to landfills. And early in their operation, they were intended specifically for the management of uh, municipal solid waste and recycling only. And as construction uh, it started uh, increasing in the county, we, we did transition to allowing construction and demolition material to come to those sites, but it proposes a lot of challenges for us. So uh, we, we do limit the, uh, the size of loads coming to the site uh, to no more than four cubic yards. So we have capacity issues with material. It it's, tends to be fairly fluffy. Uh, we pay for the haul by the by the ton and truckload out of those sites, and it's a really inefficient way to move that type of material from our side of things. Um, also, we have challenges with unloading. Uh, that uh, uh, lumber and material like that, long and bulky items, tend to get log jammed in the uh, trailers, and it creates uh, creates some pretty substantial challenges trying to get the trailers unloaded when they come to to not landfill. <clears throat> so, what do we offer for uh, uh, construction and demolition material? Um, the, the first bullet here, it, I'm not going to beat up just the construction industry, but it's, it's, it's everybody in the county. We still see an awful lot of recycled material coming into the waste stream. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, what we're doing to help address that. Um, but uh, out of all the material coming to the landfill, about 30 to 40 percent of that tends to be related to the construction industry. And right now with construction booming the way it is, it's probably more than 40 percent of the waste coming to not landfill is construction related. Um, things we see in the waste stream, uh, cardboard, scrap metal, and wood waste, those are the three items that Jordan highlighted in his presentation. Uh, very common to see. These photographs I just took in the past week or two out here at the site, uh, not unusual to see construction was coming, construction was coming in with a lot of those types of materials. <clears throat> we do have a, a recycling opportunities available. Um, the recycling center, not landfill, and all of our transfer stations accept scrap metal and cardboard free of charge. Um, the, the recycling center at Knott Landfill and our transfer station up at Redmond also handle wood waste. Uh, we do charge for that $4 a cubic yard. Uh, the wood waste is, is ground and transported to a bar 7A in Redmond, and they process it further and then ship the, the, the material to a, a facility down in the uh, Klamath Falls area that remanufactures it into a particle board. Um, so that, that gets recycled within the state of Oregon. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the hazardous waste uh, um, element. We do see a fair amount of hazardous waste coming into not landfill. We are not a permanent facility for accepting hazardous waste, so we take a pretty aggressive approach to it. Um, some of the things that come in commercial loads we see pretty often are paints and stains, industrial adhesives, and fuels and solvents. I added lithium batteries to the list here because that has become a very serious problem for us. We probably have three to four fires a month at not landfill caused by lithium batteries. Um, we've been fortunate enough to catch them early on, but uh, nationwide there's been a number of major facility losses due to uh, fires caused by lithium batteries. Uh, the photograph is not an exaggeration. That's exactly what they look like when they get run over by our heavy equipment out here. And uh, we're we're really concerned about uh, the, the, these coming into the, the waste stream on a, on a pretty frequent basis here. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we do offer business hazardous waste management services in, in the county. Um, uh, Jordan mentioned the uh, uh, latex and oil-based uh, oil paint and stains. Uh, uh, the state of Oregon has a paint collection recycling program, which our recycling center participates in. Um, anybody, including businesses, can bring up to 10 containers of latex and oil-based paint and stains to the recycling center and leave them there for free. Um, we also accept used mortar oil at no charge as well. 
<clears throat> Deschutes County has a household hazardous waste collection program we've hired a contractor to, to run. And although the county doesn't get directly involved in the management of business hazardous waste, our contractor does offer a service uh, for management of hazardous waste generated by businesses. Um, the program is fairly easy to use. The contractors here on site at not landfill twice a month. And uh, um, the businesses do pay a fee for their waste, and it depends on the nature of the waste and how much they have. Um, and uh, information on, on the, uh, the program is available on our website. Um, and I've, the website's also, also listed on the, at the end of the presentation here, too. Um, it's, it's like I said, it's fairly easy to use. There's a registration form to fill out. You show up with your waste in the form and a method of payment. Contractor takes it away. You get all the legal paperwork you need for the DQ and the EPA, and uh, you're all set. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening now and in the future with in Deschutes County. Uh, currently, the diversion, diversion rate in Deschutes County is about 33%. Uh, about a third of the waste generated in Deschutes County does not come to not landfill. It gets diverted to recycling. Um, the DEQ has established a diversion goal for Deschutes County of 45% by 2025. Uh, we, we did a, a, a comprehensive solid waste management plan update back in 2019. Uh, driven by a, a number of things. Uh, one of them is this goal that the, the DEQ has set for us. And there's two areas that we focused on that, that we believe have a pretty high payoff for achieving these, these goals. And one of them is construction and demolition waste. Um, I mentioned earlier that 40% or more of the waste coming to not landfill times can be demolition, construction and demolition waste. We're also looking at uh, multifamily housing and tourism with this as well. Um, Jordan also mentioned there's been some recent statewide legislation changes that's going to result in some improvements in the recycling system. Um, but uh, uh, we're, we're looking at doing a number of projects to achieve these goals as well as uh, uh, um, improve the service available in the county. <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about growth in the county. So uh, this, this chart here shows the, the annual tonnage coming into not landfill since 1999, the year I started working here. You see, we had the big building boom that went through 2006 and hit the Great Recession. And then we've been on a, on a steady climb. And certainly since 2019, it's gone up. The, the dash line represents my forecast for this year. So far this year, we're having 14 to 15% growth in tonnage coming into not landfill over last year. And uh, with this growth, we're, 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 we're figuring that not landfill is going to run out of capacity in 2029, just a few years down the road here. We're now in the process of uh, beginning to look at siting a new landfill in Deschutes County. Um, so we've got a number of improvements that, that are coming down the pike here. We're in the design phase of, of constructing a new recycling, recycling center and transfer station for Redmond. Uh, the Negus transfer station Redmond is, is pretty old and tired. It's over capacity. Um, and uh, with that new facility, we may be able to expand the, the management of construction demolition waste at that site. Um, one project I've been working on, I'm hoping in the next month or two to release it, we're going to do a solicitation for a landfill gas utilization project for not landfill. Um, the renewable na uh, natural gas uh, industry has, has definitely uh, blossomed quite a bit and landfills are, are, are a prime source for that. So we're hopeful we might be able to get a beneficial use project going for the gas generated at not landfill. Um, we're we're uh, we're embarking on constructing our second to last cell at not landfill uh, next year. Um, we have cell nine; uh, it's in the design books right now, and uh, we'll be soliciting for construction in uh, in 2023. And uh, that's the second to last cell. Uh, 2029, we'll have our our cell ten will be filled up, and we'll be out of out of out of operations at not landfill. When we when we finish the facilities at Negus, we'll we'll transition to working on the Southwest Transfer Station to do improvements at that site as well. Hopefully, uh, uh, bolstering uh, services for the construction and demolition industry there as well. Um, I mentioned we're siting a new landfill right now, and uh, it has to be ready to receive waste in 2029. And then finally, the the one big thing. This was a recent development. I had a a, a a company that contacted us, they are taking a look at possibly construct, building a construction demolition recovery, recovery facility here in Deschutes County. Um, right now, the option for contractors, if you want to re recycle your material, you need to separate it out at your job site and bring it to our facilities. Um, th this facility, if it, if it moves forward, you'll be able to bring a mixed load of waste from a, a, from a construction site and pay their tip fee and dump it on their floor and they'll go through the sorting process and get the recyclables out of and get them into the system here. <clears throat> so we have a lot, of, a lot of work coming down on us for, for the next few years here. 
Um, if you want information on any of the services we provide here, you can go to our website. If you're curious about what we're, we've been doing, looking at with our um, solid waste management plan, that's available on the website as well under the planning tab. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Paula and uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chad, that was great. Um, I learned so much uh, by watching it, so thank you. Um, Paula is gonna take us next into a little deeper dive into some, maybe some job site construction waste. So take it away, Paula. Thank you, Jordan. By the way, I am filling in for Kirby Nagel Hout Construction, who had hoped to do a presentation for us, but um, given the frenzy of the building industry, they were not able to uh, uh, commit to it. So, without further ado. So, Chad gave us a really good view of what's happening in Central Oregon which pretty much mirrors what's happening at the national level. Um, at a national level, we're seeing over 6% of our solid waste stream um, being composed of wood waste, almost 10% metals, and almost 15% cardboard. Now, when you look at those materials, not all of them are coming from the construction industry, but certainly a significant amount of them are. And if you look at the history of wood waste management, um, it's really interesting to see how in the late, the mid eighties, um, there started to become an effort to start reusing um, wood waste through the combustion with energy recovery. That can often have um, mixed results. It all depends on how much you're doing, what you're doing to uh, screen your pollutants and other things. So some people are not fans of um, energy recovery. Um, some people are, but uh, we definitely need to deal with the pollution side of things. The important thing here is this darker blue area, which represents when um, wood recycling started really becoming popular. And so it kind of uh, started in the early 90s and was increasing in popularity all the way through 2015 and then everything leveled off. Uh, what I think is most significant about this uh, chart here is what Jordan alluded to is that our construction waste continues to grow. So we're seeing very little growth in construction recycling, yet almost a doubling of the amount of construction waste that we're producing. Now to give a little historical background, in 1995, uh, Deschutes County, I actually, <laughs> yes, enjoy the hair. I see you laughing, Jordan, go ahead. Everybody gets a laugh there. So 1995, I was able to participate in a historic study with Deschutes County, where we had four construction companies that participated in a pilot project. What they, and Kirby, Kirby Nagel Hout happened to be one of those particular companies. And what they all found is that they saved money on tipping fees. They felt the additional labor was worth it, but there were definitely some common pain points, which I'll share later. Um, but the important thing here is how Kirby Nagel Hout, um, by participating in this study, um, recycling actually was ingrained into their com company culture. And for those of you who, um, particularly Chad and others, if I can point out right on this article here, $7 was the tipping fee for the first yard there, guys. And it was a uh, dollar to, uh, uh, I think it was $2 to recycle your scrap then. Okay, next slide. So what we're seeing now is that still there is only a small percent of committed contractors in Central Oregon who are recycling. And um, 
in order to fulfill Kirby Nagel Hout shoes, I asked them and a handful of other contractors, their experience with uh, recycling. Uh, Dream Home Builders was one of the ones um, along with Kirby that was able to provide the most significant information for us today. Uh, the three materials that are highlighted at the top echo what has been presented by both Jordan and Chad. The most common materials and best materials for recycling for construction sites are cardboard, scrap metal, and wood waste. Some of our participants were also recycling um, drywall at a limited capacity because there's limited opportunities. Some were also recycling a limited amount of plastic, brick and concrete, as well as organics. So as far as recycling scrap metal, almost anything metal can be recycled. There are certain things that um, are metal that do uh, include a fee and that would be appliances, but otherwise metal recycling is free. Wood waste, a lot of wood waste is recycling. And what is exciting about this as opposed to 1995 is what I've highlighted here at the bottom. Nails and staples are acceptable. That was a pain point for builders back in the day. Um, but in general, you'll see the, the, the stuff that you expect. You're looking for your old two by fours, your decking, your fencing, used lumber, painted lumber, plywood, particle board, pallets and crates, um, uh, lumber scraps and engineered wood. Um, the stuff that is not acceptable, most importantly, would be um, bolts, heavy hinges, uh, rods, cable joists, so your metal fasteners. Um, but otherwise, I mean, everything else is pretty obvious. They don't want any of your cement hardy backer. They don't want any of your metal clad wood or vinyl. Oops, I think I jumped ahead too fast. Corrugated cardboard, pretty simple to recycle, just flatten it. They don't want anything waxed or slick coated. Uh, no polystyrene foam or any paper. Sorry, I can't see my screen here. Uh oh, what just happened? I don't know why that jumped, why that enlarged. Sorry, guys. Okay. Try that again. All right. Um, so when I asked these contractors, what were their pain points? How do they get people involved? These are the answers that they provided for us. So getting staff and subs to participate, you need to supply the dumpsters for each material. You need to inform and ask the subs and their employees. Um, you need to inform them where the bin locations are and how to recycle. And what was interesting is, um, and this has not changed since 1995, these contractors are periodically having to go through the containers to make sure there are not any contaminants in there. Um, and what uh, Dream Home Builder said is they, that the subs seeing them go through those containers really helps let the subs know that they mean it. So quality control, how do you reduce that contamination? Again, it's providing enough containers. Uh, constantly checking is the key. And so again, from Dream Home Builders, if subs see that you allow contamination or mixing, they're not gonna participate. So it's really important for these builders to stay on top of it. Um, if they see you slacking off, they're gonna slack off as well. And then of course, finally, they do check the dumpsters before they're picked up. The challenges for the job site recycling are time, space, people, um, having enough dumpsters and trash on site and getting the subs to use the correct container. Suggestions for improvement, um, getting everyone on board at the start of the job, having a recycling program as part of a pre-project meeting is a good practice to really ingrain that into the uh, job site culture. Again, having enough dumpsters on site. Uh, this is more forward thinking and strategic, but ordering materials cut to length to reduce the fall off waste, and then trying to avoid or limit materials that are not easily recyclable. And I couldn't help myself but including the comment from Dream Homes that said, like spray foam, yuck. Has anybody ever dealt with that stuff? I mean, it's gross, it's, bleh, it's really hard to deal with and it does not come out of the laundry. 
So the economics of, I see Karen's laughing. She knows. <laughs> Been there, done that, huh? So for economics, um, so these comments came from Dream Home Builders, but what he said is that some places have fines on projects that exceed a given threshold of landfill waste. So, um, and again, his commentary here, because most builders will not do anything unless they don't have to, sad but true. Uh, he says, if there were fines, there would be economics involved. So in the current situation, economics is only coming into play when you separate concrete and masonry because those um, materials weigh so much, they're adding a lot of tonnage to your landfill fees. So there is an economic incentive to recycle those if you can get the practices in place on the job site and the way to haul it to the landfill where they can, or the recycling center at the landfill to separate them. But it does cost a lot less to separate those items than it does to landfill. And what Dream Home estimates is that they've been able to reduce their uh, waste load by 20%. So that's pretty impressive for a small company. I wanna just step back though and look at the big picture. As Jordan alluded to, these materials not just don't, don't just fill up our landfills, but in production um, and uh, the whole life cycle. There is a carbon impact. There's a huge impact by using all of these materials. And I think it's important to note that the United States is the world's largest steel importer. Yet in 2019, we imported uh, 26.3 million metric tons of steel while we landfilled 10 and a half million tons of steel. I just want you to sit with that for a minute because I think that's important to take into consideration. So you look at those import and those export trends, and what you can see is that uh, it's changed dramatically over time. And you'll see that, you know, right here, 2009, we had a huge, huge recession. And so that's why you're seeing this big dip in our imports. Um, and again, if you can't, you know, the, the, the imports are the red line, the, the exports are the blue lines. And then you kind of, um, it's interesting to also look what was happening 2017, 2018, 2019. We had a, a different president. We had a lot of different policies and that were discouraging imports. So that probably correlated with uh, the reductions there. And then of course we have the pandemic. But Anyway, just bear in mind while we're importing all of this steel, almost 9% of our waste stream is scrap metal. And that just doesn't make sense to me. So what's the future? In 30 years, we barely moved the needle on construction waste. And in fact, in looking at Chad's information, we've actually lost ground. Where construction waste is now 25 to 40, or what did you say, Chad? I think 35 to 40% of the waste stream. That's not good. We need to change those market dynamics. We need more contractors committed to sustainability that are driven by conscious consumers. We need more policies to incentivize waste reduction or disincentivize wasteful behavior as alluded to by um, Dream Homes, as well as some of the policies that Jordan mentioned. And then we need to prevent waste using strategic thinking and alternative building materials. But most importantly, at a systemic level, we need to view natural resources as natural treasures, not commodities. Back to you, Jordan. Great. Thanks again. That was that was great, Paula. Um, and I really did enjoy that uh, old picture from the newspaper. You, you've been at this for a while, so it's great to get your experience on the panel, it really is. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Karen for the last 10 minutes here, and uh, she's going to bring us home talking about hemp lime, and then we'll open it up for a panel discussion. Thanks. Over to you, Karen. Thank you. Um, and I actually, I'd like to circle back on the pozzolan that you were talking about, because with hemp lime, if we use a hydrated lime, we need to, uh, to have a pozzolan uh, for it to bind. So it, it just it makes me interested to know if we can use that with hemp lime. That'd be great. But hi, everybody. My name is Karen Rugg, and um, I am a general contractor here in Central Oregon. Um, 
my my background, my previous life, I was a con commercial construction manager for 16 years, so I am very familiar with construction waste. I have filled more dumpsters than I'd like to count um, and seen a lot of things go to landfill. And that was one of the many reasons why I wanted to do a mid-course correction and get into more natural buildings. So I've got a presentation here today on hemp lime, which is the main focus of perennial building. I think Carly's gonna pull that up. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Rugg and I'm the co-owner of Perennial Building. We're a general contractor based out of Sisters, Oregon. And while we do traditional construction, our main focus is hemp lime construction. So I know the panel today is talking about construction waste and how we manage that. Hemp lime effectively eliminates any construction waste or the need to manage it. So if you've heard of hemp lime before, that's great. But if you haven't, that's understandable because it's only now becoming popular in the United States since the 2018 Farm Bill allowed for hemp to be grown. But in other parts of the world where hemp is legal, um, it's been a way to build for many, many years. Hemp lime, and it's also known as hempcrete. It's used interchangeably. Hemp lime is a building material that's made from the hemp herd, a lime-based binder, and water. So this picture here on the upper left, this is the fiber hemp plant, which building grade herd is typically made from. The cell structure of this plant's a little different because it has to uptake the water from the ground and get it all the way to the top of the plant. And since they're tall and skinny, it creates a cell structure that allows for moisture to move more easily through the stalk. This is a picture of the stock. This outer layer here is bast, which gets removed for paper, clothing, and other products. And this inner stock here is what they chop up to make the hemp herd, which is what you see in the lower left-hand corner. That herd is then mixed with a hydraulic lime or a hydrated lime plus a lime base binder to allow it to cure a little faster, as well as water. And you mix that all up and it looks like this right here. So, and it's typically non-structural, it would get cast around a structural frame, although some people are experimenting or doing R&D for hempcrete structural panels or blocks, but typically it's non-structural. It is the complete wall assembly, um, with the exception of the finishes, but it takes the place of insulation, drywall, house wrap, and exterior sheeting. And then it's finished with a natural vapor permeable material. You'll see a lot of times it's finished with um, a lime render or lime plaster on the inside. It's the same thing. It just depends on the location, whether it's called render for the outside, plaster for the inside, or you can leave an air gap and do wood cladding or stone. Um, just it has to be vapor permeable. There are four ways that it's typically installed. The first is cast in place. This is a video of a food storage building that we did. So you erect the structural frame and then you install these form boards similar to a concrete form board and cast the hemp inside the walls. And as you get each course done, you move the form boards up, you keep hemping the walls until you're all finished. And then <clears throat> this is what it could look like in the end. This is a very basic building, no windows. Again, it was just for food storage. Um, but this is what it looks like with a, a non-pigmented lime plaster. The second way is blocks. So you can pre-make blocks and then lay them like bricks with a lime mortar. You can spray apply it or you can panelize it, which again is great because you can prefabricate and then erect on site. And this is a picture of panels being erected in Holland in three days, this house is being erected, which is really cool. Um, one thing about hemp lime that's important to know is after you cast it, it does need some time to dry out. So depending on what your environment's like here, it could take three weeks and other places that's um, more wet, it could take you know three months. So you have to plan for that in the schedule. Uh, but again, if you use something like blocks, pre-made blocks or pre-made panels, you don't have to worry about that. You can just erect them and then finish them with the plaster. And if you don't allow them to dry, if you put plaster on it, then the tannins wick out and can um, stain the, the plaster. There are a lot of benefits of building with hemp lime. The first is that it's natural and non-toxic. So I think we all know that a lot of our building materials have toxic uh, 
chemicals in them that cause a whole slew of health issues, proven health issues, um, asthma, allergies, it can affect our endocrine system, affect the way we learn. Um, there's so many to list. And so these buildings are natural and non-toxic. It's fire resistant. There's ASTM testing out there from the US from a company called Hempitexture out of Idaho that they provided their sample of hemp and lime binder and it got a zero smoke develop and zero flame spread rating. And you'll see if you go to YouTube, people are holding flame throwers and torches up to hemp line and it doesn't ignite. So here in this area around the West Coast, this would be critical um, to build with a fire resistant material. It passively regulates air quality, also passively regulates humidity. So it keeps the humidity inside between 40 and 60%, which is ideal for humans. It also, because of that, um, and its pH environment doesn't allow for mold or mildew, mildew to grow. It has thermal mass in addition to the R value. So testing has shown that it's R value between two and three per inch. It also has thermal mass. So it's a much more dynamic heating and cooling machine, essentially, this building. And it uses less energy and doesn't need a ventilation system. It's also carbon negative. It's less than net zero. So even though the line process is pretty carbon heavy, the amount of carbon the fiber hemp plant absorbs from the atmosphere actually offsets the lime or the carbon that's, that's produced in the lime process. And when you take the lime and the hemp and you mix it together and it starts to cure, it also starts to absorb carbon. So overall, the material becomes uh, carbon negative. And there are people working on um, life cycle analysis and product category rules um, to, to prove this and to, to uh, certify that this is the case. But a lot of studies out there actually show that. It's highly renewable. You can get I think two and a half acres of hemp grown can build a average size house in the US. And depending on where you grow, you can actually get two harvests per season. So it's, you know, it can provide a lot of housing for a lot of people. Earthquake resistant, pest and rodent resistant. I mentioned before, it's a full shell. You also have design creativity with this. A lot of natural building uh, that I've seen you know, kind of boxes you in, in in what you can do, but with hemp line, you can do a lot of different design aesthetics. And then I mentioned construction waste at the beginning. And so hemp line is all natural. If there's extra material left over on the job site, you can just leave it in the subgrade and then cover it up. And at the end of its life, it's actually compostable. So you can take it and put it back in the earth and it will just, it will, essentially break down and return to where it came from. There are also people that are experimenting with using hemp lime from one building after its useful life and mixing it in uh, to other mixes and putting it in other buildings. So these are just some examples of what hemp lime buildings can look like. This is a lime plaster on the left here of this house and then wood cladding. This and this house they left it exposed which I think is beautiful and here you can see where hemp lime has been left exposed and then finished. So the current challenges right now for the hemp building industry education uh, one not a lot of people know about it so we are in the process as well as everyone in this industry to educate people that this is an option for building. It's not part of the building vernacular right now here in this country but uh, we, we hope it will be. We have to educate subcontractors in the workforce. The building departments have to be educated. Um, also, uh, and another challenge is the supply chain right now because this is a new industry. Even though some suppliers are coming online in Montana and Colorado, you can't just go to the store and pick up some hemp herd or you can pick up some lime in some places, but you can't just go and pick up herd. So Right now, this is a challenge, but I think as more as the demand grows, you'll see more suppliers come online. And then building regulations, I mentioned educating the building department. 
Right now, the US HBA, which is the United States Hemp Building Association, is in the process of working to submit hemp line to the International Code Council, the ICC, um, to get that accepted there. And then from there, we want to work down and get it uh, incorporated into the in International Residential Code, like straw bale or light straw and clay is right now, and other building regulations. So I mentioned the USHBA. If you'd like to know more about hemp lime, they're a great resource. They have we have we have regional um, groups, and we've got committees that we we work with. That all of them are working on whether it's education or research um, certification. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of folks working on promoting the hemp building industry, and so they're a great resource. Go and join. Um, and then also our website, perennialbuilding.com, you can find out some information there. So thank you for listening. This was a lot of information kind of jammed into 10 minutes. And um, if you have any questions, I look forward to answering them on the panel. Thanks. Great, thanks, Karen. That was, that was excellent. Um, once again, I have learned a lot. Um, and a 10 minute presentation. So uh, we are going to turn to the Q&A. So if you are a part, if you're an attendee, uh, please do type in your questions to the Q&A function if you have them. Um, it looks like we have one question typed into the Q&A and then we can address the ones in the chat after, after that. Um, there was a question about, could you talk a little bit more about glass pozzolan and how is it, how it is used by concrete manufacturers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Sure. So glass pozzolan is what you call a supplementary cementitious material or an SCM. It's very similar to fly ash, which comes from coal combustion. Um, other, we used to use fly ash as a cement substitute a lot here in Oregon. Um, we're increasingly not using fly ash because our coal plants are shutting down, which is a good thing. Um, but we are now using steel slag, typically imported from Southeast Asia. Um, so that uh, glass pozzolan is literally just glass ground up into a very, very fine powder. When it gets below, I think it's like 50 microns, I can't remember it, it actually becomes a cementitious material, a pozzolanic material, when it's in the presence of traditional um, limestone cement, Portland cement. So it acts just like fly ash would act like. We've usually been seeing replacement rates um, around 30%, somewhere in up, upwards of 40 is the max. Um, but like other pozzolans like fly ash, it slightly slows the curing of concrete. So you're gonna get a, a slower set time, um, which can affect project schedule. Um, overall, uh, it's, it's a really great alternative. We're seeing a couple of manufacturers on the East Coast. Um, the main one is a large plant out of Connecticut called Urban Mining Northeast. And um, we've been entertaining interest from them and others in setting up a West Coast operation because we really need a home for our glass and we need to reduce the impacts of concrete. So that's a little bit about glass pozzolan. Um, and I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, please feel free to type in others. Um, Karen, you had mentioned a question on before we move on from glass puzzle on, there's a bunch of other questions. Was there anything else about glass you were curious about? No, I think that'll answer it. I'm gonna uh, do some research because that would be a local source of um, a lime binder that people could use for, for hemp lime. It'd be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, feel free to let's connect afterwards too because there's a lot of manufacturers willing to send out a few buckets full um, for uh, experimentations. So, so let, let's, let's do that. Okay, great. Uh, there was a question that was asked. Um, I think this one might go to maybe uh, Chad first. 
has there been any interest in a public-private partnership in Deschutes County to recover and or salvage construction material for reuse slash sale? There's some activity in Portland like this. When we were uh, developing the new facilities in Not Landfill that opened in 2007, we, we toured a, a number of, uh, of similar facilities and uh, we entertained uh, doing some kind of a reuse operation. The problem was a lot of these places ended up looking like junkyards. The material came in for intended for reuse and it just didn't seem to go out. We saw quite a few of these places and that just was not the direction that the county wanted to go with building these new facilities. Uh, currently, <clears throat> there, there's always a trailer park over at the wood waste uh, disposal recycling area at the recycling center uh, that uh, um, Habitat Restore uses. So if, if uh, contractors or customers come in with, with uh, still usable uh, lumber, um, uh, sheet goods, things like that, they can leave it in the trailer and uh, Habitat Restore comes by periodically and, and takes it back to the yard and, and empties it and brings it back out. Um, but other than that, there really hasn't been, I haven't heard of any discussions or movement towards trying to do something uh, um, along those lines. I, um, I think with the, the movement these days, I, I think that's something that may, we may entertain having conversations about if somebody's interested. Thanks, Chad. A, a follow-up to that is, um, since I don't live in Deschutes County, I'm wondering, do you, are you finding much of the C&D waste is from new construction or is it from things like demolition of old buildings because folks like places like city of portland they have deconstruction policies but obviously that's only going to address the waste coming from homes slated to be demolished any sense of how that waste is coming in from different construction activities you know i i think on a day-to-day -day basis the majority of the the, the um, wood waste coming into the recycling to the to the landfill is from new construction uh, where we see the, the C&D impact is when there's a major demolition project going on in town. There's been a few projects over the years in town. It's just astounding how much waste comes in from tearing down a large building. Um, when I, I, a prior life, I worked for the city of Palo Alto in California, and uh, the, the scale house uh, at the landfill took the time to actually track the, the weight of the loads coming in from the demolition of a house. And I... I wish I could recall how how large the, the tonnage was, but it was it was a very large number. It was quite amazing just how much material can come out of a demolition project. But again, on a day to day basis, it's primarily uh, in new construction. There's far more new construction going on in 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 Deschutes County right now than demolition projects. Thanks. Uh, one more question, generally about wood, and then I've got a a, a hemp lime question for Karen. This one is just about framing material. I know some of your uh, material goes into new particle board construction and gets recycled. Um, are you guys framing out there with mostly pine or fir? I think the question might be directed towards Karen. Uh, um, I, I, we don't do any framing out here at the landfill. <laughs> Um, we, we frame typically with just the lumber you find like at a Home Depot or a Hoyts or um, so it's mostly, um, I believe just pine. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, right. Cause uh, that, you know, in the Willamette Valley, we'd get mostly fur. And um, I'm curious because different, different wood recyclers, um, you know, need specific species um, to make their new products. And so that's why I was, I was curious what was out there. Um, if I can interject something here, you know, it's interesting, uh, at least for particle board manufacturing, um, they're, they're pretty much indifferent to the species or nature of the wood. They'll, they take any, any form of uh, lumber or sheet goods, OSB, uh, plywood, even old particle board. So um, it doesn't seem to be uh, driven by any particular species or, or particular type of wood product. Um, they'll they'll like take virtually any kind then run it through the process to make new particle board. Hey Karen, I was wondering for hemp line construction if you could talk a little bit about what you see as the scaling potential of this construction technique, and also how actual hemp production in Oregon does or does not align with a future supply chain. So for scaling, I think right now, um, the supply chain 
is holding us back here in the United States. Um, a lot of builders here in the US have to go overseas to get building grade material. Um, there are more domestic, so you can get some from Canada, um, and there are more domestic suppliers coming online in the US um, that are working towards producing building grade herd. Um, it's it's pretty critical that you get herd that's dust free. That's a, you know, some people use different sizes, but it um, there is a specification for size. And so we're kind of dialing that in right now. Um, you do see like, for instance, Global Hemp Technologies is a company out of Canada. They have, I believe, 624 acres in Colorado right now, where they're doing a vertically integrated development that's going to have hemp processing and hundreds of hempcrete homes. Um, and so people are coming on board. I think the potential is here if uh, the the building regulations change, which the USHBA is working on, um, as well as, again, education, supply chain, it kind of all goes back to those three um, major hurdles, and I hate to say hurdles, but three, three, you know, major things that we're working on. Um, as far as the hemp industry in Oregon, most of the hemp here is CBD and THC. And so that plant tends to grow a little bit uh, shorter and doesn't have that height that we were talking about. So most building grade herd is made from the industrial hemp plant for that's grown for fiber. Now that said, um, actually one of our clients is a grower for um, a C CBD company out of Washington and his farms are here in Oregon. And so he is doing R&D on the CBD plant to see how that measures up performance wise to your typical fiber plant. And so, you know, in my view, if you have a CBD or THC plant where say, you know, the cell structure is a little bit smaller, maybe it doesn't transfer as much moisture. So the performance is just slightly um, lower than fiber. You know, what is the offset there to using local herd? So I think hopefully, um, the R&D will be done where um, those plants, fingers crossed, will be able to be used because obviously in places like Oregon and Washington, it's all over the place. Me, when we started a couple of years ago, uh, friends of ours are CBD farmers and we took some of their material with a wood chipper and tried to process it ourselves and it didn't work. <laughs> Um, it, you know, there was too much fiber and um, all this other stuff, but I think if you have the right equipment and the performance isn't hindered too much, it, it hopefully will be an option for us. Great. That'll be very fun to see that develop here in Oregon. It looks like we just have a couple of minutes left and there are two more questions in the chat. Uh, one follow-up for Glass Pozzolan. Is there currently an available source in the Northwest? Um, no, there is not an, avail uh, an available source anywhere on the West Coast. Uh, do you know if it could be used in pervious concretes? I also don't know the answer to that, um, but I assume that it, yes, it could be used in pervious concretes because pervious concretes are mostly about your aggregate sources and less about your cement contents um, from my uh, knowledge. So that's glass. And then um, Karen, maybe you could finish us out talking a little bit about um, how hemp line construction compares cost-wise and time-wise to other forms of maybe traditional, I don't want to say traditional, but current construction techniques. Um, sure. Um, yeah, you know, about, I've seen a lot of different research on what the increased percentage of cost is when you do hempcrete to um, traditional construction. I think people hear natural building and they assume that it might be less expensive, like you might be doing cob or, or you know, uh, straw bale. Um, it has been more expensive by about 10-15% because the supply chain and having to import materials and then of course getting the, the people who know how to build with it uh, can be challenging. However, in the last year with the lumber prices spiking, I really do think that hemp lime became more on par with traditional construction, which is, you know, what we want, or, you know, we'd like to get it even less than, so it's more accessible for people. Um, 
you know, and in a place like Bend, where you have construction square foot costs at 300, 350 a square foot, you know, I think we've priced out projects where you can do hemp lime within that square foot cost. So, um, and then what was the second part of that question? Oh, and uh, schedule. So with hemp lime, you do have to allow it to dry. So, you know, you, you wet the mix and you put it in the walls if you're doing a cast in place on site. And so in this uh, environment, it would probably take three weeks to dry out before you want to put plaster on it. You can do certain techniques where you use bricks on the inside and then cast on the outside. So you can go ahead, do the bricks, start your interior finishes, and then while you're waiting on the outside to, to cure um, and get dry enough and then do the finishes then. So you just, you know, you have to educate the client and um, subcontractors and work on a schedule and it's all very doable. Hmm. Can you let the whole thing dry from the inside and Weather you can let the whole thing dry from the inside or the outside. However, um, it would be better to let it dry from the outside so you can do your interior finishes and then come back. You know, in some, like in England or in, in wetter environments, you may have to let it dry for six months. So come back the next year to, to plaster. Great. Well, I know, I think either Paula or Carly has a, something to close us out here, but we are just... Um, two minutes away from the end of the session. I just wanted to um, thank all of the attendees for asking some good questions and staying engaged and being interested in um, building uh, in, in Deschutes County. And uh, big thanks goes to all of the presenters. Um, thank you, Karen, Chad, and Paula for just sharing your knowledge. I certainly learned a lot. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and, and definitely I have follow-ups for all of you guys. I, I am excited to, I'm excited to connect with you all afterwards. So um, I will turn it back to Paula here and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan. And I agree. It's definitely a conversation to keep going. So before you leave uh, the conference today, we will have a word from 350 Deschutes, one of our honored and esteemed board members. And we also ask that when you do log out, that you complete the survey um, following this webinar to share your thoughts. It really helps us to put a better program together next year. And then finally, um, please do attend our last sessions um, tomorrow. We've got some really great information for you on financing clean energy projects for the commercial industry. And we also have a presentation for solar for everyone. And uh, there should be a link in the, um, in the page. So, um, and don't forget, you know, your donations really, really help make 350 Deschutes a more effective organization. So I will turn it over to the board member. Hi, I'm Diane Hodiak, Executive Director of 350 Deschutes. We hope you're enjoying the free webinars and we hope to keep our conference free in the future. You can help us by making a gift of five, 10, 25, $100 or more and visiting 350deschutes.org forward slash donate. And if you do decide to give at the $100 level, we will be including a $20 gift card courtesy of Sun River Brewing. So please donate today at 350deschutes.org forward slash donate. Thank you so much.